O God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. The collect for this Sunday after the Ascension is filled, appropriately enough, with lofty language. But what does that mean for down-to-earth believers like us? For folk who try to stay faithful, even as we may often wonder if Jesus has flown the coop, hearing how he once sailed back to heaven to sit safely and gloriously at the right hand of the Father, well out of the reach of the troubles of this earth and its inhabitants. Will a savior sitting in the heavenly courts really meet me in the messy realities of my ordinary life and in the brokenness and violence of our world? What do we do with the assurance that Jesus has returned to the heavenly realms wherever they are? that Jesus has taken his ruined and risen flesh and blood body, human body, into the fullness of divine life, so that our human nature is now held and perfected in God. A nice thought, but maybe not necessarily immediately motivating. It leaves me feeling a bit like the first folk who had to deal with the ascension, looking up and standing still. While he was going away, they were gazing up toward heaven, and suddenly two guys in white robes stood by them and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? Silly question. Some 2,000 years later, however, we're still here, still staring at the heavens and wondering often, where has Jesus got to? Looking up and standing still, it's not a posture that gets us very far. It only got Jesus' friends, his first friends, back to a familiar place, that famous upper room, likely the same room where he broke and blessed a piece of bread and shared a cup of wine with them on the night before he died. The same room where they once huddled, some still frightened in the aftermath of the crucifixion, some grief-stricken in the face of their loss, some guilty at their failure, but others beginning to feel an impossible glimmer of newness breaking through with the women's reports of that empty tomb. Thursday last was the Feast of the Ascension. The prayer book calls it a principal feast of the church, just like Christmas and Easter, only the pew's not so full. Who wants to celebrate being left behind and left alone? Who needs a feast day to remind us of an absence, an absence that persists, even pursues us with haunting memories and yearnings that have trouble finding words to speak of them. An absence so real because there is within us a knowledge of a presence that changed and charged us forever. Luke gives us nine days between the ascension and the arrival of that fiery, windy spirit This Sunday marks in-between time on Luke's calendar of salvation. And for me, it does evoke that question, where is Jesus now? And maybe I'm not the only one who asks that question on a regular basis as we grapple with hard realities in our city, in our nation, in our world. The disciples were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. I'm glad Mary was there. Perhaps she was still pondering in her heart all that she had seen and heard. She already knew what it was like to be overshadowed by the Spirit, a Holy Spirit. She already knew about the costliness of the call of love and the mysterious claim of God upon a human life. She had spent a lifetime loving a child and losing the man. First to the likes of Peter and God, then to the likes of Pilate and God, and now just to God. So maybe it was Mary who called upon them to wait and to pray because she knew that only prayer could hold them now. This is a community a powerless and empty community, a community as powerless as a cross and as empty as a tomb. 
These are folk who are trying to trust and hold on to hope, yet without words to bring their dreams and fears to speech. I do understand that. Powerless and empty describes lots of us who cringe at the nearly daily reports of all manner of gun violence. It has happened in too many places and too many times for too many years, the senseless violence that continues to take too many lives. Nearly 16,000 Americans have been killed by guns so far in 2023, and more than half of them by suicide. There have been 226 mass shootings so far in 2023, and it's only May. Our hearts are broken, and it seems as if the soul of the nation is shattered, perhaps beyond mending. Most Americans are angry and anguished and demanding immediate change and direction from our elected officials, and nothing happens. Another portion of our citizenry sees no problem with laws and policies that permit unfettered access to guns and limited access to mental health care. Mass shootings make the headlines. Suicides are a silent, deadly epidemic. Our national policies around both guns and mental health must bring us face to face with a terrible judgment that convicts this nation for its refusal to protect our most vulnerable. There are no easy answers for our hard and heavy reality. I struggle not to become numb to the overwhelming experiences of violence and grief that roll over us and over us again and again like tidal waves. But a gospel chapter that invites Jesus' friends to gather, to wait, and to pray well, that might be what we need. I have learned that my prayers do not change God or even change this tired, broken world. But praying changes me. Changes me, strengthens me for facing the damaged and distorted world this of ours with a passion for healing. Praying helps me find glimpses of beauty and community that remind me to hope. We do have each other, not to make sense of the senselessness, but to touch our mutual pain with love and tears, even anger and fear, and something more. In a nation founded on the premise of the separation of church and state, I find it terrifying how many politicians are claiming Christian warrant for their efforts to legitimate guns and diminish access to all kinds of health care. More terrifying is how those efforts bear no resemblance to the Jesus of our Gospels. Sending Christmas cards with pictures of your kids holding assault weapons misses the point. We can't preach partisan politics in church. It jeopardizes our tax-exempt status. I've been a rector and a dean, and I know that. But maybe it is time to take the Christian Gospel to the public square to respond directly with the truth of Jesus in the face of hate and greed, to publicly defy ugly assumptions that co-opt our Christian faith in service of power and privilege as a mask for white supremacy and a tool of so-called Christian nationalism. And you know, I find that the pastors and preachers and congregations of the black churches do this so much better than folk like us. They learned how to do it from prophets like Amos and Isaiah and Martin Luther King. Some of us even remember when Dr. King told the truth of Jesus on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. I have a dream, he said, for all God's children. You can't get much more public than the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. I believe we Episcopalians could get better at this kind of testimony. And what might it look like, ponder that, my friends, a 21st century faith-based movement affirming inalienable rights like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We're not seeing so much of that these days. Today's gospel gives us Jesus saying goodbye yet again, 
And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus' prayer lifts those he loves into the presence of God, like a priest who lifts the bread and wine and prays that God may fill such ordinary things with the very presence of Christ. Jesus is the high priest who offers us still and always to God, the one who prays that we might be filled with that same love to heal a hurting world. Those disciples couldn't yet imagine how that promised comforter would fire them up and blow them open and out right onto the mean streets of old Jerusalem. How they would risk their very lives to proclaim the truth of Jesus. How they would give up all they own to pronounce God's forgiveness in the face of human sin, to announce God's kingdom in the face of hostile earthly powers. Maybe that's hard for us to imagine too. They teach us that waiting upon the spirit still begins with looking around rather than looking up, looking at each other, at the ordinary people in our ordinary lives, Jesus left us with a new way to find him now, not in his body, but in ours, and in the bread and wine that we share. The ascended Jesus is no longer anywhere on earth, so that the risen Christ can be everywhere in all creation. That is the good news. News that is still hard to hold on to, I think, in times and seasons that hold the promises and perils of radical change, of unbearable newness and heartbreaking losses, even rumors of a power to be unleashed that will charge the likes of us with the glory of God so that we might change the world. For them, it was nine days. For us, it happens over and over again, this graced and awkward, and haunting interlude. To rest in it now seems appropriate in the ongoing aftermath of losses and grief and fear, in the uncertainty about our future and touching our vulnerability, the vulnerability of our children, the world's children, knowing all too well what it can feel like to be powerless as a cross and empty as a tomb. But the promise given on every day since the ascension as that we are where Jesus will be found now. So we wait together this day and always and pray as they did, for Jesus is not done yet, so neither then are we. We wait and pray for that fiery, windy spirit who will fire us up and blow us out, even to the mean streets of Chicago, to tell the world that God reigns and Jesus lives so that this beautiful and broken world can work another way. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth.